Good afternoon, Madam President. Uh, delighted to join you. It's nice to see you up there. Uh, I want to thank the gentlelady, the, uh, the good chairman of the Government Administration and Elections Committee for her rundown on the bill that is before us. I think uh, she did a pretty thorough job of describing what is in the language uh, that is before us. Um, I have a lot to say today. Um, some of it, uh, you know, directly related to the language in the bill and some of it directly related to the things that I think are um, very obvious and clear omissions from the language in the bill. Uh, but I think the thing to st start with is the actual um, sections of the bill uh, itself. Um, we covered section one, which is about moving the primary date, section two, about addressing the concerns with towns that had um, formerly had May municipal elections are now uh, changing to November, and we needed to address that uh, with regard to the municipal um, presidential primary for those towns. Um, section three regarding the tabulators, I think this is a good um, policy moving in the right direction to require separate tabulators uh, in these particular situations because obviously having a dedicated tabulator means that you'll be able to know what votes were cast in what location, helping us to determine if there is any uh, potential discrepancy or concern over what happened uh, to nail it down rather than uh, you know lumping a lot of different uh, ballots into one location. Um, uh, sections four and five begin to talk about the re-canvas procedure, which is something that I have been uh, advocating for for a number of, of years, and I'm very pleased that the um, uh, language made it into this bill uh, that clarifies the situation in a re-canvas or a recount uh, that makes it clear that uh, people that are there uh, representing the candidates from the various political parties actually have the ability to see what's happening. Uh, I think formerly the language in the law said that uh, people had the right to observe, uh, but the moderator could interpret that to mean that they could observe you know, from 20 feet away across the room where you can't really see what's happening. And this language here will fix that uh, to make it abundantly clear that people that are there to verify what's happening actually can stand right there and observe the ballots going into the machine and they can see what's happening. So I think that is a, uh, a very good provision and something I'm very excited to see make it into this language. Moving on to the uh, a later paragraph in that section, there is discussion about the moderator. And uh, I do have a question for um, the good chairman of the GAE committee on this section. I just want to verify for the record that we are not expanding the power that a moderator has to remove someone uh, who is a disruption at a re-canvas. I believe they've always had that power, uh, but I have not had the, um, uh, the time or energy to uh, be able to review the current statute versus what's happening in this paragraph, lines 157 through 164. And um, I trust that uh, we're mirroring that language to some degree. Um, and in certain, um, I want to make certain more than anything that we're just not granting any additional power to the moderator to remove people. So if the, uh, the good chairman would answer that for me, I'd appreciate it through you, Madam President. Thank you, Senator Flexer. Thank you, Madam President. Madam President, if the good senator would just uh, repeat the line numbers that he was referencing, I would very much appreciate that. Senator Sampson. Uh, thank you, Madam President. I'm referring to lines 157 through lines 164, which appear to be all new language in Section 5. Senator Flexer. Yes, uh, thank you, Madam President. Madam President, um, yes, this is new language, and um, I, as I know the good senator will recall, this language was in a bill uh, that we heard in our committee um, earlier this year that, that passed with um, strong support. And it is um, some new definitions around um, what disorderly behavior might entail and what the moderator can do uh, in the event that that kind of behavior is taking place at a re-canvas. Thank you, Senator Sampson. Uh, thank you very much, Madam President. And I appreciate that answer. Although I don't know that it went d directly to what I was asking, which is I, I want to make sure that we're not expanding the moderator's authority beyond the current law. And if we are, uh, there's a justification for it through you. Senator Flexer. Uh, thank you, Madam President. Madam President, I don't know that I would describe this as an expansion if instead of a, a clarification uh, and, and perhaps a... Um, 
a way to codify current practice. Um, so right now, there it's a little bit gray um, in terms of what a moderator can do when these um, incidents take place at a re-canvas. And so I think the language before us just gives us some clarity. Senator Sampson. Uh, thank you very much, Madam President. I appreciate that answer. Uh, and I'm satisfied with that. I mean, I read through the paragraph. It sounds like the current uh, status quo type of policy, uh, but I did kind of want to just uh, dig into it a little deeper to be on the record that we at least had a conversation uh, making it clear that we're not trying to expand the moderator's ability to be able to throw people out uh, for Marie Canvas. Uh, I mean, they should have the power, certainly, if someone is disruptive or failing to follow the appropriate and lawful instructions, uh, to be able to take action. But um, we don't, we don't want to give them so much authority that that uh, can be abused. Um, moving on to the last couple of sections, and again, I'm trying to go through this relatively quickly because uh, my concerns really lie with what's not in the uh, proposal uh, versus what is. Um, but line, uh, section seven and eight have to do with um, the election monitor statute. And I know that the final section of the bill uh, is intended as a correction because my understanding is that the state budget uh, provided the funds for the election monitor to the uh, um, Elections Enforcement Commission and really that money should have gone to the Secretary of the State. And uh, I think this is a correction uh, to make sure that that money is now uh, redirected to the, uh, the to the secretary's office. Um, the rest of the uh, two sections have to do with um, current law, but since um, this is a topic that is in the news today, and I think it's something that um, people are curious about, I think we should just dig into the responsibilities of the election monitor just a little bit. And the reason why I want to do that is because um, it seems clear to me. Uh, that some folks in the majority have been uh, pretty adamant that the uh, issues that we're experiencing in the news lately, um, particularly with the uh, the video from Bridgeport, which I'm going to get into in just a second, um, that this election monitor is somehow a solution to that. And um, I'm not going to say that the election monitor cannot uh, be a benefit, uh, but I don't know that the um, mere addition of an election monitor at the expense of $150,000 salary is going to actually get to uh, where we need to go with regard to firming up our election integrity. So the first question I have, um, Madam uh, President, through you uh, to the good chairman is, uh, where is the money for this uh, election monitor coming from? Through you. Senator Flexer. Uh, through you, Madam President, the money was appropriated in the budget that was passed uh, by this legislature earlier this year, the sum of $150,000. Again, it was uh, erroneously allocated to the State Elections Enforcement Commission. It's intended, and what we're hoping to do today is to move it to the Secretary of the State's office, which is where previous positions of election monitors that were funded by the state budget uh, were in the past. Senator Sampson. Uh, thank you, Madam President. I appreciate that answer. So we just heard that that money came from the state budget, which effectively means it came from the taxpayers of the state of Connecticut. So that means that the people all across Connecticut that are uh, you know, required to pay taxes in our state are effectively funding the election monitor for one community. And um, I have a small concern with that. Uh, because I don't know that uh, it's the responsibility of the very well-run communities that I represent to be looking after um, election irregularities in one of the state's major cities and, and funding it um, when they don't have the same benefit and the same protection in place. Um, I might also ask that if an election monitor is such a good thing, then why don't we have one everywhere? Um, I'm also a little concerned about the monitor's powers. I'm reading lines 223 through 233, and I understand this is existing law, but maybe the good chairman can confirm for me that it appears from reading this that the election monitor has nearly, if not I the identical powers to the secretary of state themselves. Um, because reading on lines 224 through 226, it says an election monitor appointed under this section 
shall conduct inspections, inquiries, and investigations relating to any duty or responsibility under Title IX of the general statutes. And Title IX effectively is the powers of the Secretary of the State. Is it correct through you, Madam President, that we're going to empower someone who uh, is identified in lines 211 and 212 as not a state employee, someone who's contracted by the state, the same powers as an elected um, Secretary of the State to carry out in this one jurisdiction? Is that correct through you, Madam President? Senator Flex, sir. Uh, thank you, Madam President. Madam President, I would not describe uh, the duties and powers given to this election monitor under existing statute as being the same uh, as the Secretary of the State. Um, this person is empowered to do this work by the, by the Secretary of the State and uh, is able to conduct inspections, inquiries, investigations, all within the confines of Title IX of basically of our state's uh, election laws. Um, and they can have access to all records that are necessary in order to do that. But I think it's important to focus uh, in response to the Senator's question that they do not have equal power to the Secretary of the State because they are doing the work in the Secretary's name and in line 228 of the bill, uh, a very key provision is there that says, and immediately report to the Secretary of the State. So this monitor is there on the ground watching what is happening, having access to all the necessary records to understand uh, exactly how the election or any election over this period of time is being conducted, but that person's power is limited in that they report back to the Secretary of the State. So I would not describe them as being equal in power with the Secretary. I would describe them as being empowered by the Secretary. Thank you. Senator Sampson. Uh, thank you very much, Madam President. I appreciate that answer. Um, I would suggest that they're not empowered by the Secretary of State at all. They're empowered by this legislative body by enacting the statute that is before us, that is the current law, uh, that gives them the authority to go ahead and act in the uh, manner described in this subsection B. And it doesn't seem to me that there's any uh, requirement to um, fall under the Secretary of State's guidance or uh, direction. Uh, it just says that they have to report to the Secretary of State any irregularities or improprieties they find. But prior to that, it says that they have the same responsibility, any duty or responsibility under Title IX. Um, and I would just suggest that this is something we may want to look at going forward. We certainly want to empower an election monitor to be able to do a thorough job of making sure that we are protecting uh, our elections, but we also don't want to be granting someone, especially a, a, just a, a state contractor, not even a, a state employee, with the same level of authority that the Secretary of State has when it comes to Title IX, which is a very broad section of our statutes that gives the Secretary of State tremendous authority with regard to uh, election law. And I, I do have a little concern about that. Uh, it's, it's just a, a, maybe, maybe an aside, but something that we should watch out for. The other side of that coin is that if the good chairman's correct and the election monitor really is under the direction of the Secretary of State, does the Secretary of State know what needs to happen in the city of Bridgeport, for example, to fight um, irregularities in elections and uh, potentially prevent fraud from occurring? I mean, will the election monitor be watching uh, the drop boxes at 5.49 a.m.? My guess is not. I doubt that they would. So I don't know that merely having an election monitor, while potentially a good thing to help um, root out uh, different types of irregularities and, and potentially fraud, I don't know that it goes um, far enough to make sure that we've removed any potential for um, things happening in our elections that we, we would want, not want to see. So all of this makes me wonder why we are not using this special session to address what we are seeing play out in the city of Bridgeport. And very likely not for the first time. And we should talk just briefly about what happened because I don't know that everyone uh, even in this um, chamber, uh, knows the details. 
uh, and certainly the press or um, folks that are watching at home. I don't know if they are, uh, you know, watching the news closely enough to know what has transpired. But I'll just briefly describe it as, as this, and that is that, you know, uh, over the past couple of weeks, there's been a lot of news because after the uh, Democrat primary uh, election in the city of Bridgeport, there was surveillance footage. Uh, apparently that was in the possession of the police department and leaked, which I know is a whole other separate issue, um, that shows a woman walking up to the drop box outside the city center um, and placing a large number of papers into the drop box. And uh, I can't remember whether she actually approached the drop box and put a number of papers in two or three times herself, but it was at least two times. And then uh, she also clearly from video from inside the building and out, you can see her direct someone else to go and bring uh, a bundle of papers and place them inside the, the drop box as well. Now, of course, nothing is proven at this point, and I don't, I don't want to jump the gun um, because I understand it's all alleged um, and things are pending in court and there's a criminal investigation and I understand that, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the folks involved in that election are uh, disputing the results and, and so forth. Um, but for me, the big issue here is that no matter what, the video shows uh, what can happen, I guess is the way I might describe it. And that has raised significant concerns. You know, Democrats in both chambers have repeatedly dismissed calls by Republicans myself included, numerous times I've got up on this floor to make the case against the um, really significant expansions in mail-in and absentee voting that we have in this state without simultaneously addressing the issue and area of security. And I've said over and over again, I'm with you. I want to make sure that we don't disenfranchise a single soul. We want to make sure that it is the easiest possible thing to do to vote in the state of Connecticut if you are a willing and legitimate voter. But when you do that, you also have a responsibility to the people of this state to make sure that that election is legitimate. And that's what this whole debate has been about over the last several years. And no one can tell me that there are not people across this country and certainly in this state, and certainly in the last couple of weeks, that are not questioning the integrity of our elections. And I'm talking about people in both political parties. This is not isolated to President Trump saying the election was stolen in 2020. And I know it's been easy for some on the left to tag people like me with that when I bring up concerns about election integrity. But for me, it's never been about that. For me, it's about the policy of the state of Connecticut that I can see with my own eyes opens the door to potential crime and fraud. Now, I should feel vindicated by this video because it only shows something I say that could happen going back years at this point and numerous debates on this floor where I've offered many amendments that I will offer again today that would have addressed this problem and prevented it from ever happening. But I don't feel vindicated. What I feel is sad that our elections remain in doubt for some people. That should never happen in this country. When I was growing up, if you had said to me that people don't trust our elections in America, I would have laughed at you. There was no doubt about the election integrity in the United States of America when I was a child. What has happened? Well, I'll tell you what has happened. Numerous policies have been enacted over the years that have led to an environment that is more conducive for bad things to happen, either intentionally and unintentionally. I want to see a very thorough investigation of what happened in Bridgeport. They should unturn or overturn every stone and find out who is responsible and exactly what transpired there. 
And anyone that is responsible, anyone that is culpable, they should be prosecuted to the full extent of the law. That is what is necessary, not just in this particular case, but it's necessary to show the people of Connecticut that we're not going to tolerate people undermining our election process. My colleagues on the Democrat side are forever talking about disenfranchisement. They're so concerned that someone might be disenfranchised from voting. And I share their concern all day, every day. I don't want anyone's vote not to count. Everyone should have the right to vote. There should be no intimidation. There should be no restrictions. I stood up in this chamber not even four months ago and offered an amendment for the number one thing that is a disenfranchisement in this state. And that is the long lines that exist at our polling locations in our major cities. Some people end up having to wait hours in line to vote. It's no surprise that they get fed up and they turn around and they go home. Those people are disenfranchised. I offer that amendment in good faith that my colleagues in both parties would say, that is something we can do. That is a legitimate thing we can and should do to fix a problem that is about disenfranchisement. And you know what happened? That amendment failed on a party line vote. Every Democrat in this chamber voted against that amendment. So again, I'm sad. I'm disappointed. I'm frustrated. I don't want to shout and say, I told you so, although I did put that in a press release recently, because it is true. My colleague, Representative Gail Master Francesco in the House and myself have been repeating the same mantra of protections for voting in this chamber and in the House chamber and in committee year after year. And we have been dismissed by the majority and mostly by the media as well. And this just goes to show that the things that we warned about can and do happen. But I'm not happy about it. And I'm not going to take a victory lap. I want to fix it. That's what I want to do, Madam President. What we saw in Bridgeport, if it is proven true, is a crushing blow to people's confidence in our elections. I don't think that people in Connecticut will look at this November's election the same as a result of that video circulating. I don't. We're just adding to their skepticism. People that know me know that I like to make an issue out of the titles of bills that come before the legislature, because I often remark that the title has very little to do with the subject matter, or <laughs> the title is you know, very biased in one direction or another, or it's purposely written or drafted in a way to make uh, people, uh, make it very hard to vote against. You know, it's a, it's a bill that's for sunshine and rainbows and puppies, you know? <laughs> but really the actual language inside uh, doesn't mirror uh, good things sometimes. It, mirror, it, uh, it um, is disingenuous. Well, this bill title, an act concerning the administration of epinephrine by emergency medical personnel and provisions related to elections is a perfectly accurate title. The problem is that we're here in special session, allegedly for emergency legislation. And that bill title, in my mind, should say, the failure to do what needs to be done. We should be here talking about election integrity in a serious manner. That's what we should be doing today. People across our state expect it. I was telling people last night that we're going in for special session, and they just assumed, oh, you guys are going to take care of that bridge board thing, right? Well, I'm going to try. I just got through watching what happened in the House, which is that my Republican colleagues down there put up a valiant effort to try and address the Bridgeport issue, to try and talk about drop boxes, to try and uh, interject some policy that would go right at what we witnessed in Bridgeport. And you know what? In one case, they were told that their attempt was not germane to the legislation that's before us. And for the people at home, please understand, you know what's germane 
in this chamber and in the other, whoever has more votes, that's what's germane. It's not about what's really germane. Ultimately, this body can write any law it wants. And if the majority decides that they want to do something, they can make it germane. They could have added it to the call for this special session, and I'm quite certain they would have received no objection from the minority. So I'm going to make my own attempt, Madam President, to try and inject some good policy into this special session. And I hope that my fellow senators in both parties have more sense than what happened downstairs where the door was slammed on trying to do what's right. Let's actually do something here. Let's pass some amendments that will tighten up our election security and send this bill back downstairs. We can do that. I'm going to offer my first of several amendments, Madam President, but I want to start by saying something I say many, many times in this chamber, which is that one great frustration I have is that we have so many party line votes on election legislation. And that just doesn't sit well with me. You know, we can have party line votes on any number of things. You know, we choose to be in different parties because we have different worldviews, different ideologies. We believe in different perspectives. And I get that. And it's healthy. In fact, something would be wrong with the world if we didn't disagree. If we agreed on everything, there'd be no purpose for us to even be here. The fact that we disagree and we can do so freely and openly in a representative government is the most beautiful thing you can imagine. But the one thing that we should work extra hard on to come to agreement, to reach a bipartisan solution on, to come to a unanimous decision, is the rules that we play by. And that's elections. If we can't agree on how we conduct our elections as Republicans and Democrats, we are a failure. I mean that. How can you have such a disparity in how the process by which we are elected be decided? It doesn't even begin to make sense. My First Amendment has to do with drop boxes. Surprise, surprise. And we've you know, had many conversations uh, over the last several days about what we might do. But in my opinion, the best solution is just to do away with them, period. You know, they did not exist before the COVID pandemic. And they were instituted based on the argument that we needed these COVID boxes for people's safety during the pandemic because less people would be inclined to vote in person and we wanted to make sure it was easier for people to vote. My personal opinion is that there was federal money hanging around and we needed to spend it. And somebody said, oh, we'll buy these drop boxes. Well, I think the drop boxes are more trouble than they're worth. The fact of the matter is if you're voting by absentee ballot, you can already put the uh, absentee ballot in the mail, which is effectively a drop box already. I mean, the one big difference between a post office mailbox and a drop box is that at least the slot on a post office mailbox is only big enough for one document at a time. Drop boxes, I, I've raised concerns about them on numerous levels. They're potentially can be tampered with, uh, particularly if they are not monitored. We are so fortunate that in Bridgeport, there was a camera on that box. There's no requirement in our law, despite the fact that I've encouraged one since the very beginning, but they were smart enough to actually put a camera on that box. And thank heavens they did. It doesn't leave room for municipalities to come up with different um, methods if they choose. What if they had a more secure method for retrieving someone's absentee ballots than the Dropbox? Are they allowed? No. Because this body 
always insists that one size fits all, that we've got to write some sort of ironclad, this is the way you're going to do it. And that's unfortunate. So as I mentioned, I don't think drop boxes are necessary anymore. I think that the current um, other means to submit your absentee ballot, to walk into town hall, to mail it in, um, is sufficient. Not to mention the fact that we are going to begin early voting next year, which is, among other things, going to expand the hours that town halls across our state are open and give people the chance to be able to walk in and hand their ballot to the clerk directly. And without the proper monitoring and other protocols in place to protect everything from um, vandalism to uh, custody issues about who can empty the box. There's a theme here, by the way, Madam President, and that is that when it comes to mail-in voting, it's that we're adding a lot of steps Nothing is more secure than someone walking into a polling location, presenting their identification, identifying themselves, and walking up to the machine and placing their ballot in there themselves. That is the class A number one way to make sure you have a legitimate election. When you do absentee ballots, think of the process and the number of steps involved and the number of people that can come in contact with that document. That's the problem. And that's what we need to get away from. So with that, Madam President, my First Amendment is LCO 10322. I asked the clerk to um, call this amendment and I'd be allowed to summarize. Mr. Clerk. LCO number... One zero three two two, Senate Amendment A. Senator Sampson. Thank you, Madam President. This is a very simple amendment. Uh, it's effectively two bracketed paragraphs, effectively removing from our current statutes the creation of the mandate for drop boxes for elections. I urge adoption, and I'd like a roll call vote. Thank you, Senator, and we will have a roll call vote on the amendment. Senator Flexer. Thank you, Madam President. Madam President, um, I rise in opposition to the amendment before us. Uh, Madam President, uh, I appreciate the conversation that we're having here today. I look forward to having a bipartisan conversation with a variety of stakeholders around many of these issues over the weeks and months to come. But Madam President, um, this amendment is just another example of opposition to the existence of ballot boxes that ever since we initially introduced them in Connecticut in 2020 has been uh, the position of, of many of my colleagues, unfortunately. And they have the right to be opposed to ballot boxes. But um, today um, is not the day to eliminate the use of ballot boxes in our state. They have expanded uh, the ability of many people across our state to vote, and they're not unique to Connecticut. Uh, ballot boxes are in use in the United States in more than half of the states in this country, um, and they're not just used in blue states or certain kinds of states. They're used in, in a wide variety of states, states that you might describe as blue, states you might describe as red, uh, states you might describe as battleground states or swing states. Um, they are in use uh, all over this country. Connecticut is not unique. Um, and while I think we can have a conversation moving forward about the rules and the use of the ballot boxes, I think if our efforts here today are about ensuring people have the ability to exercise their right to vote, we shouldn't move forward with an amendment that will go back to making it harder for people to vote. And finally, Madam President, Madam President, I would just say that um, there are concerns about the use of mailboxes as well. And while the amendment before us is about ballot boxes, I don't know how you can guarantee uh, some of the concerns that the good ranking member raised uh, in his lead up to proposing this amendment. I don't know that there's ever going to be something um, that we can do to eliminate uh, some of the details that, that he shared. And so, Madam President, I hope 
uh, my colleagues um, will reject this amendment um, and, and ensure that, that the people of Connecticut will still have the ability to exercise their franchise and, and use uh, ballot boxes. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Flexer. Will you make my pitch for an amendment? Uh, but there was so much dialogue on everything but the amendment um, that I feel compelled to get up and, and bring us back to the amendment that is before us. Um, I, I just want to address a few things. First off, when it comes to my comments about the election monitor and the $150,000, my point was that the city of Bridgeport is the only city that's getting an election monitor. And I was asking a rhetorical question that if an election monitor is needed in Bridgeport and it's something that is going to help us prevent uh, fraud or uh, irregularities in elections, then why don't other towns deserve them? So my point was not about uh, whether or not the people of Bridgeport deserve an election monitor or whether people across the state should be paying for Bridgeport. The idea is that we're asking everybody in the state to ante up and pay taxes, but they're not being treated equally. Bridgeport's going to get an election monitor. The city of New Haven won't. And um, it makes one question whether people truly believe the election monitor makes any difference. If you think election monitors are necessary because of what's going on in our election process, then I think secretly you might share some of the same concerns that I do. And then you might have to ask yourself, why am I only putting this in one city? I also want to point out that there are states across the country that have drop boxes, but there are also states that have gotten rid of their drop boxes. Wisconsin announced on September 22nd, just not even a week ago, no more drop boxes. Supreme Court in Wisconsin said that they are ripe for fraud. The concern about post office boxes is completely legitimate. And I would never suggest, and I don't think I have, that drop boxes are the problem. I'm going to get to the problem before the end of our debate today, I promise, Madam President. Drop boxes are just a symptom of the problem. The problem is the expansion of mail-in voting. That's the problem. And I'll just close with this, again, urging my colleagues in both parties to vote in favor of this amendment. Drop boxes did not exist before COVID, and we got along just fine. And there are numerous mechanisms to vote by absentee, and we are expanding them constantly, as you all well know. But the one thing people in this room should recognize is that the world is watching. People are paying attention. You know, the one thing that's different about this debate versus the last five or six debates that I've had just like this is that people are paying attention. The news media is actually going to maybe report what I say in here today. It could happen. Everyone who's seen that video in Bridgeport recognizes that whether that is an exact case and it's irrefutable proof or not, one thing it's uh, proof of is that it can happen. That it's extremely possible for people to be stuffing ballot boxes. And if nothing else, getting rid of drop boxes prevents them from being stuffed. I move adoption. Thank you, Senator. Will you, re Mr. Clerk, kindly announce the tally? Well, Senate Amendment A, House Bill 7001. Total number voting 35. Total voting yay, 12. Total voting nay, 23. Absent not voting, 1. Amendment fails. And uh, if we could, if we could have quiet in the chamber, because I do believe that Senator Sampson would like the floor. Senator Sampson. Thank you very much, Madam President. I don't want to uh, sound like I'm... Uh, We're just going to ask our very distinguished visitors to keep it down so that we can pay attention to your, your discourse. Senator Sampson. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Madam President. I, I appreciate order in the chamber. Very much, so thank you. Um, I mean, I don't want to come across like a, like a, a trial attorney uh, by saying let the record show, but we saw the result of that last amendment. Another party line vote. And I asked myself, well, what is it going to take? What is it going to take to get the majority to recognize that there is a real issue 
out there in the world that our constituents all across the state are paying close attention to. And I think they're paying closer and closer attention all the time. I wrote down something earlier, which I'm trying to find. Willful inaction. Can you hear me okay, Madam President? I feel like my... Yeah, I think there may be an issue with your... Let's try that, son. Yeah, so I was just lamenting that the previous amendment pa uh, failed again on a party line vote, an amendment that I've offered in this chamber numerous times. But today I thought it's a different environment. You know, the issue's been in the news. I think it's getting more attention now than it has ever since drop boxes were first introduced in Connecticut and across the country. And it's extremely frustrating for me because I know what I'm doing is right. I'm here <laughs> for the sole purpose of trying to protect the integrity of our elections. For all the talk about disenfranchisement, the greatest disenfranchisement that can occur is to have an election that is not fair, that's illegitimate, where someone takes away your vote because they vote unlawfully. Why is that not treated with the same importance as any other type of disenfranchisement? As I mentioned, people are watching. And willful inaction today, with full knowledge of what's at stake, equals culpability. People will remember how we voted on these amendments today. I will make sure of it. And they should know. The people of Connecticut deserve to have an election process that they trust. And in order to get there, we have got to make corrections. Something is clearly wrong. In the vein of drop boxes, I understand we weren't willing to go the full measure of getting rid of drop boxes in one fell swoop. I believe we should, but in lieu of that, I've got another amendment, Madam President. This one is LCO 10324. And again, I asked the clerk if he could call this amendment, and I'd be given leave of the chamber to summarize. Thank you, Sen uh, Mr. Clerk. LCO number 10324, Senate Amendment B. Senator Sampson. Thank you, Madam President. This is a much more narrowly tailored amendment that effectively says that we will suspend drop boxes in the city of Bridgeport until we receive the report from the election monitor. Admittedly, this is not a perfect amendment because it doesn't do all of the things I would want it to do. But at least it's a start. It says we recognize that there's a problem in Bridgeport, and as a result, we're going to elect the election monitor that we were just referring to in the underlying bill. We're going to let them do their job. And in the meantime, we're not going to use the drop boxes until we know that they are safe and secure. I move adoption. Madam President, I'd like a roll call vote. Thank you, Senator, and we will have a roll call vote. Senator Flexer. The machine is locked, Mr. Clerk. Much, uh, Madam President, oh, and the microphone is working much better now. So let the record once again show that there was another party line vote on another amendment that would, I think, very narrowly attempt to address what's going on in our current news cycle. Concern from people in both parties. And I'll remind everyone that there has been significant concern voiced from people all across the state in all walks of life in both political parties 
This is not a Republican versus Democrat issue. This is, do we care about maintaining the security of our elections and protecting the sanctity of every person's right to have their vote counted? That's what this is about. So I'm hoping the news media reports today's events accurately and makes it very clear that even in the narrowly tailored case of suggesting that only in Bridgeport and only until an election monitor is done doing their job, we're going to suspend the use of the drop boxes there. I don't know how more narrowly tailored we could get to try and address the problem that we're facing. Disappointment is all I can say. It's all I can express that I cannot get through to my colleagues on the other side of the aisle. As I said a little while ago, the drop boxes are certainly an issue, and we should absolutely address them. But they're just a symptom. They are a symptom of a larger problem. And the larger problem is the series of policies passed by our state government over the last I would say at least four or five years, but maybe a decade, that have effectively eviscerated many of the protocols that we have that protect our election process. You know, other states that do significant amounts of absentee voting, mail-in voting, they have security measures in place. They have a requirement typically for signature verification. When you sign up to register to vote, you have to give them your signature, either on an electronic device or in some way that they scan it. And then when you submit an absentee ballot, they actually compare that signature digitally to make sure it matches. And they can adjust the threshold. Is it a 50% match? Is it a 70% match? That kind of thing. Do you know what we have in Connecticut? My Italian grandfa grandfather would say, Ugats. That's what we got. Nothing. We have nothing. And my understanding is in the last several elections, the Secretary of State has said to um, moderators all across the state, it doesn't matter, count the vote. And I'm sympathetic to the notion that we should count all the votes that we can. But we have no security. There's nothing in place. Most other states that do absentee ballots they require photo identification. You've got to make a photocopy of your driver's license and attach it and send it in with your absentee ballot. In Connecticut, again, ugots. Nothing. This is the problem. And I've said many times in this chamber, I would be much more sympathetic to our expansions of absentee balloting, including no excuse absentee balloting, if we left it simply up to the voter to decide whether they want the absentee ballot. But we don't do that in Connecticut. We've had two separate si uh, excuse me, systems. During COVID, the Secretary of State and the administration decided to spend millions of taxpayer dollars to mail out absentee ballot applications to every registered voter in the uh, 2020 primary and then the general election. I have all of the figures here. I will not bore this chamber with the figures, but let's say that it costs millions of dollars to do that. But that's not the scary part. The scary part is how many of those ballot applications were returned in the mail as undeliverable. I heard from people all across my district. In fact, at one point, I stood on this floor and I listed hundreds of people that have contacted me telling me about how they got uh, a ballot application for their uh, uh, somebody who's deceased in their family, their spouse or a parent, how they got uh, ballot applications for people that used to live in the same address that they do. In ca in, there's cases where people got four, five, six ballot applications for people that don't live at that address. It's a mess. Hundreds of thousands of ballots returned in the mail, or ballot applications. What's more concerning is that in the general election in 2020, more than 50,000 ballots went unreturned. 
You talk about disenfranchisement. I thought the point was we want people to have a vote, to have the right to vote, to have the access to vote, and to have their vote counted. Well, there's something wrong with a system that has so many errors in it where people's votes are not counted, and the potential is there for people to fill in ballot applications for other people because, as has been pointed out numerous times by people in both parties on this Senate floor, no one really knows who's filling out that absentee ballot. And that's the bottom line here. The most secure method of voting is when a person walks into a polling location and identifies themselves and casts their vote themselves. They know their vote was entered into the system and they're crossed off the list. When you have a system that willy-nilly is sending out ballot applications to people all across the state, whether they legitimately live here or they've moved away or they're not even alive or they're in prison, and there's a failure to properly track them, of course you're going to see things like videos that we're seeing from Bridgeport. Now, I'm not going to suggest that this is some grand scale, tens of thousands of votes are being affected. But it's happening, and I would venture to guess that it happens on some scale in nearly every town across our state. People filling out ballots or ballot applications for their parents that are elderly or for their kids that are away at school. And it's not right, Madam President. None of that is right. We need to go back to a system that's legitimate. And for me, you do not have to interfere with access to do so. And the argument from the majority saying that I'm trying to limit access is completely disingenuous. I have said over and over again that I'm more than willing to expand into no-excuse absentee voting. Let anyone do it. The difference is I believe that the voter should be the one to decide they want the ballot and the application that precedes it. Instead of what we have now, which is the state sending them out arbitrarily, having them lost in the mail, having them redirected, having them misapplied, or having towns do it, or worse yet, what we saw in the most recent election, and I want people to listen up very closely what happened in the last election. What happened in the last election was disenfranchisement on steroids. Because you know what happened? By virtue of our laws passed by the majority in this chamber over my opposition and objections, it's now perfectly okay for a political candidate in this state to send someone, the people, of course, that they think are going to vote for them only, they're not going to bother to send them applications to people that they don't think are going to vote for them. So they target their voters and they say, I'm going to send all these absentee applications to my people. And then other candidates also send them to their people. So what if you're a person that's not somebody else's people? That's the question. So some folks are being given this opportunity to vote by absentee by candidates and political parties uh, and political operatives to be able to send them out. And the competition is not who's the better candidate. The competition is not who's got the better policies. The competition is now who can send out more applications and get them into someone in front of someone's face so that they can be filled out and, and returned. That is no system that we should be proud of. You can fix it, though. You can fix it without affecting access. And the way you do that is by saying that we will maintain all of the viable reasons to be able to vote by absentee. And any person can follow the law to do so, just as they do today. The only difference is that instead of enabling political operatives to be sending out ballot applications, the voter has to make a conscious decision to ask for one. And we can make that so easy. You can do it online. You can stop by. I don't care if you make it available at the post office or the supermarket or the senior center. I don't care. Imagine the savings to the state of Connecticut besides by creating a robust program to allow that policy instead of mass mailing with a hit or miss situation based on our terrible voter rolls. 
I have so many questions that I wrote down for our date debate today. I'm not even going to ask them because I don't want to waste all the time of this um, uh, chamber's uh, members. I already know the answers. What has been done to secure our voter rolls over the last five years? You're right, Ugats. The solution, Madam President, is to end the unsolicited mailing of absentee ballots by everyone, by the state, by municipalities, by candidates, by third parties. You make it so the voter gets to decide whether they want an absentee ballot and no one else. And to enable that policy to go forward, which will solve the Dropbox problem, I noticed that um, the good chairman mentioned uh, that many of the problems that would be an issue with drop boxes also exist for post office mailboxes, and sh I don't disagree. This would eliminate many of those problems as well, because what you would have is a much more limited number of people voting by absentee. Effectively, only the people that truly choose to vote by absentee. <laughs> Wouldn't that be great? Instead of having mountains of paper floating around the state, creating um, a significant potential for irregularities and fraud. And with that, Madam President, I have my, uh, I think, fourth amendment. It is LCO number 10327. Maybe it's only my third amendment, sorry. I asked the clerk call this amendment and I'd be allowed to summarize. Mr. Clerk. LCO number 10327, Senate Amendment C. Senator Sampson. Uh, thank you very much, Madam President. As I um, mentioned in my lead up to the calling of the amendment, this is very straightforward. This does not alter the provisions that allow people to vote by absentee ballot. Nothing changes. They still can use the same exact reasons they can use today. No one is restricted. No one is disenfranchised. The only difference is we are taking the decision to mail mountains and tons of paper through the mail by political operatives and campaigns away from them, and we are empowering the voter to make the decision to get an absentee ballot. I move adoption, Madam President. I like a roll call vote. And you shall have a roll call vote. Senator Flock, Mr. Clerk, please announce the tally. Senate Amendment C of House Bill 7001. Total number voting 35, total voting 812, total voting 823. Absent not voting one. Thank you very much, Madam President. Uh, let the record once again show another party line vote. A sincere attempt on my part to try and rein in the potential for irregularities in our election process, which I think deserves more attention than that. Earlier, I was talking about the process that we have for absentee balloting and how we are far beyond, behind, rather, far behind the rest of the country in the security process that we have. We have no signature verification process, and we have no photo identification process, and that's true in our in-person elections as well. People are always surprised when I tell them that, even in my own district, because in the towns that I represent, I know it's common practice for people to walk in with their driver's license and say, look, here's, here's my ID, I'm here, I'm here to vote. So much so that I think that they expect that that's the law and requirement under the law, but it's not. In Connecticut, you have to provide um, some proof of identity, but it doesn't have to be a photo identification. And that's something that we've worked to try and change many, many times in the past. And much like today, it's been voted down on a party line. The amendment that I'm about to call is similar, except that it is specific only to absentee ballots. This would add a level of security to our absentee ballot process so that people who were in up to no good and engaged in nefarious uh, manipulation of absentee ballots would have to go through an extra step. They would actually need to have a photocopy of the driver's license of the ballot that's being submitted. I believe this could go a very long way to addressing the potential for fraud. 
Madam President, the clerk is in possession of LCO 10320. Um, can you have the clerk please call this amendment and I be given leave of the chamber to summarize. Mr. Clerk. LCO number 10320, Senate Amendment D. Senator Sampson. Thank you, Madam President. Forgive me, I got a little bit out of my groove getting up after the, uh, the last um, uh, roll call vote, uh, but this amendment is exactly as I just described it. It is specific to absentee ballots only and what it would do is it would require that someone voting by absentee would have to provide a photo identification at the same time that they're submitting it. And along with this requirement, we are including a provision that the state of Connecticut would waive the fee for someone to have such an ID. Now, I understand that you know we've debated this sort of thing on photo ID for regular elections in the past, and the the uh, charge is always that we're spending money, which I always find so ironic since I have stood here in this chamber and have never voted for a tax or spending increase since I've been here for 14 years. <laughs> Why would I begin now? And if there is some modest expense to give identification to the very, very few individuals in this state that can't afford one, I think that's a worthwhile endeavor if it secures our elections. I move adoption, Madam President, and I'd ask for a roll call vote. We will have a roll call vote. Senator Flex, sir. Thank you, Madam President. Madam President, I have a few questions to the proponent of the amendment. Senator Sampson, prepare yourself and please do proceed. Senator Flex, sir. Thank you, Madam President. Madam President, um, I understand that the amendment before us would cover any fee for the identity card in question in the proposal through you, Madam President. Senator Sampson. Uh, thank you very much, Madam President. The amendment says in lines 19 through 22, the commissioner shall waive the fee for any applicant who does not have the means to pay such fee, including any applicant who is a resident of a homeless shelter or other facility for homeless persons or a certified homeless youth or a certified homeless young adult. And I think it goes beyond that and includes people that uh, meet certain qualifications. It's certainly not for every person, that's for sure. Through you, Madam President. Senator Flex, sir. Thank you, Madam President. So, Madam President, this is only for voters who are attempting to vote with an absentee ballot. Senator Sampson. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, and through you, that is correct. Senator Flex, sir. Thank you, Madam President. And Madam President, in the proposal before us, uh, in order for an absentee ballot to be accepted and that vote to be counted, the voter would have to include a copy of the applicant's photo identification through you, Madam President? Senator Sampson. Thank you, Madam President. That is correct. They would be required, as in line 71 and 72, uh, that they must uh, include a copy of the applicant's photo identification and shall also be inserted in the outer envelope. Senator Flexer. Thank you, Madam President. And Madam President, just to be clear, in the outer envelope, and what's the purpose of that? Senator Sampson. Thank you, Madam President. That is to ensure that the person that sent the ballot back is also the person whose ID was included. Senator Flexer. Thank you, Madam President. But it's in the outer envelope so as to protect the privacy of the vote in the inner envelope as well, correct? Senator Sampson. Thank you, Madam President. That's very astute. That is correct. The purpose okay. is only to verify that the vote is being um, registered by that voter, not to um, you know, ex uh, disclose what their vote actually is. Senator, thank you, Senator Flexer. Thank you, Madam President. Madam President, um, how would a voter get a copy of their photo identification under this proposal? Senator Sampson. Uh, thank you, Madam President. I, I think obtaining a copy of your driver's license is, is quite easy. You can get a photocopy in many places, Staples, uh, maybe the local post office, a bank, um, a friend who has a photocopier, a um, smartphone might have the ability to take a picture that can be printed. I think there's many ways to easily obtain a photocopy. Certainly not outside the realm of anything else we do as far as uh, providing proof. I mean, for instance, people have a constitutional right to the Second Amendment, but we require they have a pistol permit, and they have to go through far more hoops to ensure that constitutional right. Through you, Madam President. 
Senator Flexer. Thank you, Madam President. And Madam President, uh, that concludes my questions uh, for the good senator on the amendment he's put forward. And I, um, I genuinely hope that we will be able to um, work in the future on proposals um, with regard to the, the system and the structure for absentee ballots in a bipartisan fashion. But I would uh, encourage my colleagues to reject this amendment uh, if for no other reason uh, than the copy of the applicant's photo identification will will create an unnecessary and I think undue burden for people who need to vote with an absentee ballot. So someone, many of the people who have to vote by absentee ballot already have challenges in being out and about in the community. And Madam President, as you know, as all of the members of the Senate may know, it is very hard for some people to get copies of things. They don't have printers in their home. Most people don't have photocopiers uh, in their home. And so if you're talking about someone who's already challenged with being able to leave their home, adding this additional requirement that they have to have uh, a photocopy of their driver's license or their photo identification in order to, to cast their ballot, I think is just an unnecessary um, burden. Again, I think there are things we can contemplate to give people confidence and ensure the security of votes uh, that are cast in any manner and votes that are cast through an absentee ballot. But Madam President, adding this additional requirement, I think it doesn't understand the cost. We heard from our colleagues earlier today about the challenges some people have just leaving their residences, the challenges that a postage uh, stamp can be for some people. And I know they are challenges for people who live in the communities I'm privileged to represent. Uh, Madam President, adding this additional burden of having to go out and get a photocopy of your ID is a really bad idea and will make it harder for many of our most vulnerable residents to be able to cast their vote. I urge rejection. Thank you. Thank you. Will you remark further? If not, the Thank you very much, Madam President. Uh, while I was waiting for the roll call vote, I got uh, a text message from someone offering to volunteer to make photocopies of driver's licenses to anyone that might need one, uh, assuming this uh, amendment passed. But since it didn't, uh, I guess we'll have to have to move on. Um, and again, let the record show I, I'm 0 for 4, which is a, a terrible batting average. Um, but when it comes to the record, I think that I'm on the right side of the issues today. Um, so far, I've made four attempts to address the potential for improprieties and fraud in our absentee ballot system and our elections, and for the express purpose of protecting the right of every citizen to have their vote counted properly in our state. And each time those uh, proposed amendments failed, failed on a party line vote which, if you remember, I opened my remarks today talking about how we should at least be able to agree on the rules of the game. And that is, in fact, our election process. So I'm gonna take another tact here. Instead of talking about actually changing the policy of how we run our elections, I'm gonna ask a more broad question, which is, do we truly believe that people that willfully violate our laws regarding elections for the purpose of disenfranchising others, should they be punished? And should they be punished in a significant way? That's the broad question. Earlier this week in, in a uh, press interview, I saw Senator Kelly um, say, for the first time we have proof, and he's right, Although, if I was him, I might have said, this is the first time we have video proof. Because the truth is, we actually have quite a bit of proof that there's activity that is unbecoming uh, when it comes to our election process that has spanned decades. And folks in this chamber know that I've gotten up here before and listed it one by one. And yet, for some reason, the narrative that says that somehow what happened in Bridgeport, this is an isolated incident, this kind of thing doesn't happen, our elections are secure, there's no such thing as election fraud, Senator Sampson, you'd have more chance of being struck by lightning, Senator Sampson, than election fraud. That's what I've been told. 
baloney. I'm not going to go so far as to say elections have been stolen or there's tens of thousands of votes at stake here. But the truth is, none of us really know. None of us really know. I've also heard people say that some element of fraud is going to exist in every election. I think the Secretary of State is on the record saying that. There's no such thing as a fraud-free election. Well, shouldn't we be striving towards a fraud-free election? The good chairman mentioned that the same problems would exist for mailboxes that exist for drop boxes. For me, I don't want any problems at either. I don't want problems. I want votes to be counted for the people that were eligible to cast them. Nobody else, no extras, no dead people, no double votes. I don't think that's too much to ask. So I just want to go on the record very quickly to say this is not a new thing. I'm very thankful that the press is paying more attention than they have in recent years on this subject. And hopefully they are watching what is happening today and they are going to report on what happened in this chamber about how the Republicans offered solutions. We're here at an emergency special session, and yet we're not addressing the most important issue to the people of Connecticut right now. Not to say there's more important issues, too. There's plenty of things we ought to be doing. We could be talking about any number of other things. But this is definitely something that I think rises to the level of being addressed today in this session. And I've heard some of my colleagues on the other side, well, are we going to talk about this in the future? Well, I hope we do. But I've heard that before. I hear it every time we have this debate. Let's talk. You know, next session, Senator, we'll get, to get together. We'll figure it out. And again, I'm not saying this because I'm trying to um, stir up any hard feelings between us. It's just a matter of fact. The majority doesn't need to listen to what we're saying because they have more votes. This chamber, it's 24 Democrats and 12 Republicans. So the only thing the majority is going to respond to are things that they want to do willfully or if something forces them, forces their hand. And that is only one thing that can do that, and that is the people. The people of the state of Connecticut have got to be concerned enough to voice their opinions and contact their lawmakers and tell them that they are tired of this. They don't want to see another Bridgeport video. They want to know that the election is secure. And I'm hoping that happens. And I'm hoping that the news media helps us today. I'm hoping that they turn this into a real story because it needs to be a real story. This is no joke. We have had election fraud in this state for decades. That's not a bold statement. I got a record of people that were fined and incarcerated over the last 20 years for election fraud. And as I go on, I just want to go back to something I said, which is it doesn't have to be 10,000 people or 100,000 people or the presidential election was stolen. There was an election in the town of Southington for a state rep district that I overlapped, decided by one vote. When I was first elected to the state house back in 2010, I won by 46 votes in an election that had around 15,000 votes cast. It doesn't take much. The race in Bridgeport that has is, is, uh, generated so much attention. We're talking about a couple hundred votes in a town that has 150,000 people. It would not take much to change the outcome of one of these elections. And that's why it's so important that we address this today. And I will remind my colleagues that a failure to address it today means you're responsible. It's our job. No one else can do this for us. We were elected to take the concerns of our constituents to this building and turn them into laws to solve problems. There is a problem out there. We all know it exists. It's our job. We're here today, right now. 
I'm going to offer one more amendment to answer that question about whether we think people that willfully commit crimes to disenfranchise voters should be prosecuted, and significantly. Just as a matter of record, I'm going to put this out here. I'm going to go through a list of cases of fraud. And this is by no means a full list. This is a very, very short list. And I'm taking it right from the October 24th, 2020 edition of the Waterbury Republican American newspaper. They had a big front page story. Um, and they listed um, these items that they uh, identified as cases of fraud in the state of Connecticut. And I'm doing this not because I love the idea of hearing my own voice or going through this list as I've done before, but it's because every time we have this debate, someone says to me afterwards, yeah, yeah, Samson, but there's no such thing as fraud. You got this one thing, this isolated incident in Bridgeport. Not isolated. I'm not going to use the names of any of these folks, um, but I do have them if anyone wants to approach me afterwards. 2018, uh, Stafford, Connecticut, two cases. A gentleman was convicted of making a false statement on an absentee ballot as well as second degree forgery, both class D felonies. Committed the crime October 28, 2017 in connection with the November 27 mayoral election in Stafford. Three year suspended sentence. A gentle lady was convicted of making a false statement on an absentee ballot as well as second degree forgery also both Class D felonies, and she committed the crime on the same date in connection with the same mayoral election in Stafford. She received a five-year suspended sentence. 2013, Hartford. The State Elections Enforcement Commission ruled that a certain gentle lady was knowingly present, quote unquote, while four voters fraudulently filled out absentee ballots at City Hall during the 2006 election. She was fined $4,500 by the commission. She appealed the fine but lost in state superior court. 2011, Bridgeport, Connecticut. A city councilwoman admitted to illegally assisting in the filling out of absentee ballots, as well as encouraging those not eligible to vote absentee to do so. This person targeted residents of an assisted living home, Harborview Towers. She was ultimately ordered by the Connecticut Enforcement Commission to pay a $500 fine. That was not the first time that she was fined by the commission. She was also fined in 2008, um, the amount of $660, $664 for excess expenditures in her failed campaign to run for the state legislature. So that's 2011 Bridgeport. 2009 Stafford, a gentle lady agreed to a consent order after the State Elections Enforcement Commission found her guilty of illegally signing and submitting two absentee ballot request forms on behalf of her sons who were living in Europe. She was given a $200 fine. 2005 Hartford, a woman voted using another voter's absentee ballot in the 2004 Democratic primary, ordered to pay a civil penalty to the Connecticut Election Enforcement Commission in the amount of 10,000, but ultimately was only required to pay $2,000 because of financial hardship. 2003 Hartford, a former state rep was charged with absentee ballot fraud after he was caught inducing elderly residents to cast absentee ballots for him. After a lengthy court battle, he pleaded guilty to felony charges of ballot fraud and agreed to pay a 10,000 fine, one of the largest fines ever imposed by the SEC. A Superior Court Judge Sutton sentenced him to two years probation in order to perform 1,000 hours of community service. I think in this list, that is the only time there's been any serious and significant penalty in one of these cases. And that's a mistake. We should create a significant deterrent to this type of activity. 2001 Bridgeport, once again, four more cases. A woman, while serving as a Democrat on the Bridgeport Town Committee, engaged in a range of absentee ballot related fraud. She completed ballot applications in the name of residents, forged signatures, and on at least one occasion got a voter to forge a ballot registration form for a family member who no longer lived in the community. She also told one voter that a candidate was not on the ballot and watched voters fill out their ballots before taking possession of them. Eventually agreed to pay a civil fine of 5,000 as barred from running for reelection. Another gentleman, a city councilman, 
pleaded guilty to being present while people cast their absentee ballots and subsequently taking those ballots while running for re-election in the town's Democratic primary in Bridgeport. He was fined 2500 and required to resign from the town committee. Another woman, while working for a candidate in Bridgeport's 2000 Democratic town committee primary, illegally persuaded voters to list false reasons for requesting absentee ballots, assisted them in applying for absentee ballots, and took possession of the absentee ballots after watching voters fill them out. The SEC fined her 5000 and banned her from working on future campaigns. And another one in Bridgeport, 2001. As part of the Get Out the Vote campaign leading up to the 2000 election, a gentleman admitted to distributing absentee ballots, being present while people filled them out, and then collecting them after an investigation, the SEC, he agreed to resign from the Democrat Town Committee, not seek re-election for two years, and pay a fine of 4000 which was eventually reduced to $1,000. And there are a few others. But you get the point. This is nothing new. This has been going on for a long time. The only real difference is now there's video proof to go along with it, allegedly. So the narrative that is pervasive in Connecticut that our elections are so secure is not real. It's like your computer gets hacked, but you keep using it anyway. <laughs> Most people would say we have to do something to fix these problems, but yet our system continues to expand and expand the wide gaping holes where bad things can happen. Other states have infrastructure and me measures in place, as I've mentioned repeatedly today. There's news stories that are coming out almost every day now, expanding on what happened in Bridgeport. There's uh, a scandal now suggesting that folks involved were allegedly um, telling people they would not be eligible for the renter's rebate program as elderly citizens unless they were able to, uh, unless they participated in the fraud. It's madness. I keep hearing arguments from the majority that they're trying to protect the less fortunate and the, the people that don't have the ability to do certain things in our society. Well, what about this situation? I'm concerned about those people. Everyone's vote should count to say that it's too difficult to get a photocopy when in fact that might prevent people from being extorted is ridiculous in my mind. Madam President, I have an amendment. It's LCO 10332. I ask the clerk to please call this amendment and I be given leave of the chamber to summarize. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. Senate Amendment E. Senator Sampson. Thank you very much, uh, Madam President. This is a very straightforward amendment. It effectively says that anyone who willfully violates any provision of Chapter 145, and if you want to look that up, that is the section in Connecticut statute pertaining to absentee ballot elections, will be guilty of a Class D felony with a mandatory minimum term of imprisonment of 12 months, which may not be suspended or reduced. It goes on to say that anyone that makes a false statement in absentee balloting would also be guilty of a Class D felony, which I believe is current law, but with a mandatory minimum term of imprisonment of 12 months, which may not be suspended or reduced. I put this question to my colleagues in the chamber. Should people that willfully interfere with our election process, potentially altering the outcome of an election, and disenfranchising every other voter that participated be punished and be punished to a significant degree. I move adoption, Madam President, and I'd like a roll call vote. We will have a roll call vote. Senator Sampson. Senator Flexer. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, Madam President, I rise in opposition to the amendment. Senate Amendment E of House Bill 7001. Total number voting 34, total voting yay, 
12, total voting nay, 22, absent not voting, 2. Thank you. Amendment fails. Will you remark further, Senator Sampson? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Madam President. Just once again, we'll let the record show that my fifth and final amendment also failed on a party line vote. I want to just take a moment to address some of the comments that were made during the debate on the amendment um, and say that I sincerely um, and, and very respectfully um, um, acknowledge the comments made by my two Democratic colleagues that spoke on the amendment. And I share many of their concerns. Uh, the thing I would say is, first and foremost, number one, the list of um, criminal activity that's existed in the realm of absentee voting um, over the last 20 years, my list was far from complete. There are far more uh, items than I mentioned here, um, and I certainly was not trying to pick and choose any particular jurisdiction in my comments. Uh, and with regard the, to the idea that somehow we have to uh, review policy and understand its consequences, uh, no one understands that better than me. But I'd like to make the converse argument, which is that I've been here on the floor of this Senate and as the ranking Republican member of the Elections Committee in our legislature for a number of years. And I've put forward these policies for public debate. And most of the things that I'm presenting today as amendments have been offered in the past and rejected in the past. And they've been offered as new legislation by me and others. And those policies were never even given as much as a hearing in the committee. So to hear that somehow we can't support your amendment, Senator Sampson, because it never had a hearing, when I've been denied a hearing year after year on the same thing is somewhat disingenuous. And I would also argue that as much as it's bad to move forward on things without having full clarity on the consequences and ramifications, ignoring the potential to do something that might improve the situation is equally as bad. And if you go back over the last several years, there's probably upwards of 40 or 50 amendments I have offered on various election policies in an effort to improve the integrity of our elections. Was every one of those things a terrible idea that had to go down on a party line vote? I'd say that's pretty disingenuous too. So I've said enough today. I'm gonna to wrap it up very quickly because I know that a lot of other folks wanna speak. But I hope that the public is watching. I mentioned earlier today that the only way we have the change that is necessary in the state of Connecticut to update our policies with regard to absentee voting in the state, barring a change in the makeup of the legislative body, is pressure from the people. And the only way that pressure, I think, is going to happen is if the press looks at this issue seriously continues to cover it and covers the events of today in this chamber as seriously and equally as well. People need to know what happened here, which is that we came in to a special session of the Connecticut General Assembly and we took up a bill having to do with elections. And the minority party attempted repeatedly to inject some policy changes into our laws to address what is on the daily news cycle, giving us great concern. And in every case, our amendments were turned down on a party line vote. Without much significant debate or attempt at finding some sort of bipartisan agreement in any of these areas. And it is true, my colleagues have offered once again to come back next session and debate these issues. But I would challenge them all today, and I hope the folks that make these decisions are listening. 
when I propose these bills next session, are you going to give me a hearing? Are you going to let the people of Connecticut come and say that they want to see changes to our election policy or not? Because to say you're going to work with me and then not take up my bills is not the same thing. I've got nothing to add other than what happened today belongs on the record for every citizen of Connecticut to be fully aware of so that they can make intelligent decisions about their representation and what they want to see their current representatives do. Thank you.